What is up, everybody? It's Adam here with another video on this bass. Uh, I wanted to be fair and give people the chance to hear this bass with the same quality as the first video I did. Um, quite a few things have changed on the bass at this point. First of which being these pickups right here. These stock ZX pickups come wired in series, and it's hardwired. Um, most multiple coil pickups, you have the leads for each coil. You can choose how you want to wire it, series, parallel, coil, split, all that kind of stuff. Well, for ease of installation, these pickups came with a hot wire and a ground wire already wired in series, so people could just drop them in, solder the two wires to their preamp, and be back up and running fairly quickly. Uh, the problem is that series wiring does not get along with my ears. I just I don't prefer it. it the, the instrument doesn't react the way I want it to in series wiring. So I talked to Bartolini after playing the bass for a while and kind of realizing there were some tone characteristics that I was kind of getting suspicious the pickups were in series and come to find out they were. And they were awesome enough to send me another set of pickups wired in parallel. So that's the first change. Here you're going to see a hip shot vintage style bridge. I've also got the hip shot ultralights right here. Um, since the video, if you haven't seen any pictures, I've got the matching wood knobs here with the, uh, the glow dots. And I've also, I'll move closer to the camera. Also, because of the weird guy that I am, I also put a black washer underneath my chrome mid-switch to keep the whole black and chrome theme going. So, let's get right to playing this thing. Um, both pickups preamp the way I normally set it, and the finger stuff sounds something like this. <laughs> So for my ear, um, and you might might not notice a huge difference because the tricky part here is that on the other video, not knowing those pickups are wired in series, my tone shaping was kind of compensating for that going after the voicing that parallel pickups give. So it may not be as drastic to you watching either video, but you didn't see all the time spent <laughs> tone shaping trying to get the bass to do certain things. So uh, both pickups still on, and here's some slap stuff. <laughs> It's just more open. It, you get more of that bottom and that snappiness on the top. Which I just, I like. You know, I, I don't like it super, super bright, but I definitely want the nuances, you know, like the finger style stuff up high. A lot of that stuff can get lost in series because of the way that that voicing works with the instrument, which we can talk about all that stuff once I'm done playing the bass. Um, here's the neck pickup. You know, just nice and warm and wood sounding. You know, if you want the treble to be less on to make it even more P bass world ish. You know, the, the parallel wiring just gives the low end just a nice, warm, open sound, which I really, really like. Now going to the bridge pickup, that real mid-heavy kind of. 
And again, it just to me the way the strings are responding and, and the way the instrument speaks, it's just more open with a lot less tone shaping that I have to do. Uh, and one of the things with this pickup, a lot of times your bottom strings, you know, your fourth string or your last two strings, if you play five, are almost kind of worthless because most of the meat, you know, is up here on that pickup because this is the treble pickup. You start going down here and you don't have much. I mean, on this bass, there's plenty of meat there, um, but especially in series, because series tends to take the low end away to my ears, um, that this making that pickup sound fat was a real struggle in series for me. Um, so that's a general idea what this bass sounds like. Uh, series versus parallel, in a nutshell, the best way I can explain it, not being an engineer, I'm sorry for any engineers, I'm going to make cringe right now. Um, these are true dual coils, meaning there's here, here, one here, one here. So you got four coils together. When you wire it in series, you're combining these coils together, the you know, like theoretically, into one big coil. So when you think of a P coil versus a J coil, P coils are flat, wide coils, which is why they have that dark, warm, woodsy sound to them. That and the you know the position on the bass, but. A J pickup is a tall, narrow coil, which is what gives it that brighter, you know, that grittier sound. So when you take a coil like this that is actually two separate coils that are spread apart, you wire it in series, you've effectively created this is one huge single coil. And to my ears, it darkens the pickup. It takes away from the low end and it shifts the mids and it, it's it sounds crowded and cloudy is the best way I can describe it. It's almost like it's overly compressed and it's a lot it's a hotter signal, so it's almost like it's a lot of sound trying to get out of a very small place. So parallel means this coil, this coil, this coil, and this coil all get their own look at the string. So you can almost think of it as like a panoramic camera that like the old ones that used to scan like this, you know, you could try and run from one side to the other and be on both sides of the picture. Well, this, you're getting four separate looks at the string. So it's a much wider sonic spectrum in parallel than in series, which is a much more focused sound. The hardware... This is a hip shot vintage style. Um, this is just a tone preference for me. This had nothing to do with, or me saying the bridges on these basses aren't quality bridges because Mike himself says that these the stock bridges on these have good mass on them and Mike doesn't BS stuff like that. So this is just a, certain bridges have certain tone prints you know, Babbitts and Go-To's and Hip Shots, and they all have a different character to them, and Hip Shots are just what I like. Uh, the first bass that I bought with my own money, that was my main player for a long time, came with a Hip Shot on it. That was the, the bridge that company just happened to use. I hadn't really been, like, turned on to Hip Shot specifically as a company, but my ear and my fingers got used to the, uh, the point that... <laughs> hip shots seem to put on the note it's just this really nice spike on the attack that lets you really cut through especially on the more intricate stuff and that's just what I grew to like um, so again this is just this is part of my journey on making this bass mine not making this bass like better but just what all makes up my sound and these tuners were purely cosmetic for me I don't really get into the whole 
if it affects the tone or not. I just wanted to continue the black and chrome, and I love how the ultralights look with the exposed gear. So this is purely cosmetic. So that all this comes over time too. That's that's part of the reason why it took me so long to do a second video. I think it's been almost a year. Is because first it was finding out all oh, the pickups are in series. I know my ear doesn't like that. Um, you know, getting this all squared away, uh, which I'll talk about next. This bridge having its certain sound signature. This all happens over time of me playing in bands, playing on different venues, recording with it. You know, it's like being used to what I expect out of instruments that I have had, what I need out of instruments, stuff like that. So this is all part of the journey. That's why it kind of takes me so long because... I just have to give my ear time to know, okay, this is how the bass is going to speak. This is how it feels. This is how it responds to my techniques. All that kind of stuff just takes time. Um, so this preamp right here started life as the Burbank Tobias TCT circuit. That's how this this was brought about in the first place. And it kind of went away when Tobias switched hands from Mike to Gibson. They decided to go with this insanely complicated <laughs> custom job and abandon the TCT stuff. And so what happened was the TCT module as, as a, a piece never went away. Barlini never stopped making the TCT stuff. What did go away is them kind of advertising and pushing and making available the pre-wired stuff that you could just drop in. So especially this particular preamp that started life in bases like this Tobias Classic 5 back here, um, if you didn't know the parts you wanted, there wasn't a document that was like, oh, yeah, we can just pull that piece of paper and this is what you need. You had to specifically order the parts and put it together yourself. And at the time, um, Barlini wasn't really known for doing a lot of one-off stuff for individuals. They were more into the licensing and, and working for bigger companies. So even still, a lot of times you would just be told, well, this is what we're using now. This is what you should use. So, And we're talking, this is years ago. I mean, um, Clyde and what he's done with Bartolini is, is incredible. I mean, that's, that's why this preamp exists, because of him um, willing to humor me and try my idea and bring it back. You know, Bartolini is one of the most amazing companies I've ever gotten to work with. So we're talking, this is like, when I tried finding all the stuff to replace the stock preamp in that guy, I might have been late teens, early 20s, which I'm not that old, okay, but that's we're talking years ago. So a lot has changed since then. But the reason why I like this, the TCT preamp over the NTMB for me personally is not a one is better. They change something in the new one and it's not as good. It's nothing like that. It's a com again, it's my ear, my weirdness. Um, it's just the way the knobs on this affect the sound, which is it's different. It works differently than the NTMB. One of the things being that the treble and bass are boost only. So a lot of the Tobiases that came with this, especially some of the really early like Hollywood ones, like the gorgeous one that Clyde had at the NAMM show that he was trying to pretend like he was going <laughs> to sell to somebody, um, they didn't have a center click in them because it was either no boost or you were boosting as you were turning the knob. There was no flat, and then you could cut and boost like on the new stuff. The mid section if you had a mid knob on the typical uh, TCT the mids were cut the TCT the cut was set at 300 the N TCT was set at 400 and the X TCT is set at 500 so the mid knob rolled all the way up was actually the mids uncut or flat ish now the genius about what Mike did when he set this up is he gave the mid knob 
a separate module, a separate mid boost module, and he even went further and gave you three mid frequencies, which this where the switch then moved over to the NT and B, and that idea continued. But the mid boost is a completely separate box, and there's also a treble boost tied to your mid knob with a trim pot that you can adjust the resistance against how much treble boost goes with the mids. Um, this one is hardwired without a trim pot, which means it's wide open. And this one, I have the trim pot wide open because that's just how I like it. But so as you turn the mid knob up, you bring a treble boost with it, which is like on a, on a graphic EQ, a lot of the times when you bring in the low mids to add that fatness to your base, you also want to bring in some of the upper mids to bring in that, the string grit to bring in that clarity and separation in the notes. This knob is an all-in-one knob. It does both. You're bringing up, I have my mid set at 250, and the treble boost is from 2K to 15K. So if I put the knobs at center, which I put center clicks on these, and the reason why is that at center click, that means the treble and bass are being slightly bumped. It's not overly bumped and overly smiley faced, but it's just enough to kind of bring in that fidelity and it's right pretty much at the spot where I would want it because if, if I start rolling up the treble from here, it gets really bright really fast. So these treble and bass knobs at center click, it's like right where I'd want the boost at, whereas on some of the newer stuff, I'd have to start at that center click and kind of roll into it, and I wouldn't be able to really reproduce it every single time. It would kind of be a ballpark. So this at center is like right where it needs to be. And then I do everything with this knob. So if if I set the bass at all center clicks, it sounds like this. You know, so there's definitely, you've got the bass boost, the treble boost, and that mid it's it's scooped for sure. It's not overly smiley faced again, but especially when you get in the upper register, there's not a whole lot behind the note. So now with the mid set at 250, if I roll that knob, and I, I always have it just goosed all the way up, then you get this. <laughs> You know, so it's bringing in that fatness, but it's also got that treble comes with it, which is, it's awesome. This is, this is the secret to this preamp for me and the sound that I like, this mid knob. It's awesome. And it's, Bartolini is incredible for humoring me and bringing it back. Um, in the first video I did for this, I had to kind of be cryptic about this because I honestly had no clue what was going to happen with this. I don't know if it was a one-off thing. I didn't. I just didn't know, so I didn't want to put too much out there and then have the guys at Bartolini kind of like, what are we going to do? Um, but thankfully, I can say it's a public thing. It's been given an official part number. Um, HRTCT 5.4 AP. Any Bartolini dealer can contact NB Goods, give them that part number, and you get the same thing I've gotten here. Uh, you can also get these. You can ask for Adam Saylor's version or for the parallel wired version of the ZX pickups. Um, I did have an extended conversation with Dana via phone and email a while ago because there was a little bit of trouble of um, getting the communication from the dealers to Dana back to Bartolini. It was kind of too long of a chain without a working part number because at the time, th these were the first ever uh, made this way. And But I think we've got it worked out. I think they've kind of got a working title number system, so you should be able to call and ask for either my version or for the parallel wide version, and it shouldn't be a problem to get them. So... Um, Dana usually definitely keeps a couple of these on the shelves. And I've also seen slash heard a rumor that bestbassgear.com, I believe it is, is stocking 
this and I think these too, but definitely this because they've been getting phone calls from the other video, which I can't thank you guys enough for that. That that's incredible to me that it also makes me know that I'm not completely crazy because I honestly made that video for a handful of friends. It wasn't a like, hey, look at this, you need to go buy it. It was just I had some friends that were curious. I was going after what I liked and just doing my thing, just just being me. And um, I just thought I was weird. You know, I just thought I was just one of those people that was just a thing I liked. And But then people started emailing and and it's just, it's surreal. It's cool that other people hear this and other people hear what I hear and they like it. And so thank you all for that. That's pretty awesome. And thanks to the, again, I can't say thanks enough to the guys at Bartolini, you know, Clyde, Doug, Dan, um, Dana, Dana be good. I mean, if it wasn't for Dana, especially Katie, and this whole journey, uh, me being with Bartolini, me being with MTD, um, them humoring me and let me go after this, like this, none of this story happens without them. So that's just, thank you guys. This is, this is incredible. These instruments are incredible. You know, that this is my professional main player like when I show up at the gig this this is what I bring this isn't the bass that I play in the videos to get all the people looking at this and whatever like that this is it this is what shows up around my neck you can professionally gig with these guys they are super super well built solid asymmetrical neck zero fret which means open notes sound like fretted notes buzz fight and tuning system you know you can get the ZX ones with the Bartolini's and the other preamp in it you can take a Z like I did and put what you want in there for your sound it's a phenomenal platform and it's so awesome that Mike thought it was important to get instruments like this in the hands of people that aren't celebrity players and can't always afford extremely high-end basses so definitely I mean I obviously recommend this bass because it's set up for me and it sounds and plays awesome for me. But I'm I'm telling you, like, even for like somewhat experienced beginners and intermediate players, I'm not a believer in this. You need to fight your instrument and earn your way kind of thing. I, obviously, when you first start out, you don't want to buy a kid a super expensive instrument if you you don't think he's going to stick with it. But I think the point earlier on needs to come where the kid gets an instrument in his hands that he doesn't have to fight to play because the problem is if you do that long enough, you can't play an instrument like this because you've taught yourself to fight the instrument and you're going to continue fighting an instrument that's not fighting you. <laughs> you know, having an instrument like this, the action on this thing is insanely low. Like you probably can't, it probably looks like the strings are touching the fretboard. Um, and I can actually get it even even lower than this I've had it lower than this um, but you know for me there's a balance of how low do you want the action versus being able to dig into the notes and keep clarity and that's a whole other conversation but just being able to express yourself without having to develop a technique around the shortcomings of an instrument is so invaluable it saves on wear and tear on tendons and your wrist and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I do not get fatigued playing this instrument. You know, my a lot of times my weekend, I'm playing six, seven sets within 48 hours. And the weight is great. The balance is great, even with this heavier stainless steel bridge on here and the asymmetrical neck and everything. It's, I don't have to work hard. It's, it's incredible. So anyway, I'm starting to ramble, but I just really believe in this stuff you know, endorsed or not, this, I've used Bartolini since before I was with them, Mike and his instruments, I mean, that, that bass back there, when I found it in a pawn shop, in a corner in a bag, was like, finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, like, that was my dream bass purchase, before I was turned on to MTD, and Mike and his instruments have always been the dream for me, so the fact that I not only get to play this, but that I'm part of the family is just incredible, so, I hope this video was helpful in clearing up why I like this, what's going on here. You got to hear the instrument. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long, but like I said, the whole picture 
just takes time. It took me playing it, knowing what the bass could and couldn't do, what I needed out of it, all that kind of stuff. So at least now this this bass has been brought up to this is now mine. You know, like it's everything on here has a purpose and it's making my sound. So uh, I hope you liked it. Like and subscribe. I'm on YouTube, obviously. Feel free to watch any of my other videos. I'll link to the first one of this bass in case this is the first you're seeing and you want to know what the series sounded like and the stock hardware and all that kind of stuff. I'll put the link to that video in the description. Also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You know, a lot of times I'll post shorter videos more often on Instagram or when I'm at sets and stuff. So if you want to hang out with me there, that'd be great. Otherwise, hopefully I'll see you around, and thanks again.